Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for August 18th, 2017. On today's show, we'll be talking about a little news, the Galaxy Quest TV series written by Paul Scheer. But what we're really going to be talking about in our feature presentation is the big news about the Obi-Wan Kenobi movie. Um, and in the mailbag, we'll be talking more Star Wars of what we expect and hope from Star Wars The Last Jedi. On me for the new on with me for the news is Ben Pearson. Hey, what's up? And Brad Oman. Hey there. So Brad, this news about the Galaxy Quest TV series broke today. You wrote it up for the site. What do we know? I did, and I was so excited to see this story break because I have been sitting on this information for months. It's something that I've known about but was not able to talk about uh, just for, you know, reasons of journalistic integrity, if you will. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I, I was so glad that this news story finally got out there. The by, by, by the way, a lot of people don't realize that. When you when you get um, to have a lot of friends in the industry, you get to know about a lot of stuff that you can't necessarily talk about. And it, it, it's quite disappointing, actually. Yeah, exactly. And uh, this so this is one of those cases, but The Hollywood Reporter was able to get this story today that uh, Paul Shear, who is one of the co-creators of Human Giant, and he's a co-star and writer on The League, and he's appeared in a bunch of TV shows and movies, uh, is writing the Galaxy Quest TV series that Amazon and Paramount Television have been developing for a while now. Uh, this is something that was in the works, um, I think it was a couple years ago, something like that. Um, but then it was halted because Alan Rickman tragically passed away, and they didn't think that they could pull it off without having the entire cast. But apparently Paul Shear's take uh, was enough to get them excited about the series again. Um, Hollywood Reporter didn't really have many much in the vein of details, but we do know that the series uh, that Paramount and Amazon are hoping to get back the original cast members, which includes Tim Allen, Sigourney Weaver, Tony Shalhoub, Sam Rockwell, and Daryl Mitchell um, as part as the crew of the NSCA Protector. And it's supposed to be taking a cue from the Star Trek reboot franchise by having the original cast featured, but there's also a younger crew that's part of a reboot of the original Galaxy Quest series. And once this news broke, we actually reached out to uh, Paul. He's a good friend of the site. You know, uh, he loves Slash Film, and so he was happy to uh, give us. A yeah, little his, bit of his his popular podcast. How did this get made? We have the the uh, what do you call that S- side project to that where uh, Blake a companion companion piece. piece. Yes, thank you, Brad. I can't, I, I, all I'm thinking is Obi Wan, Obi Wan. Okay, uh, companion <laughs> piece to that on the site with uh, with Blake uh, writing oral histories of of those movies. So w- we have a relationship with Paul. Uh, and you, yeah. you, you got some quotes from him. Do we have anything interesting? Yeah, I mean, so uh, uh, we were just interested in how this all came about because uh, Paul hasn't really taken on a series of this magnitude before. Uh, he's done a lot of comedies, things for you know Adult Swim and some network stuff here and there, but this is by far the biggest project he's undertaken. Uh, and so he told us uh, this whole thing came about very organically. I was meeting with Paramount about developing a TV pilot that I had brought to Sundance, and during the conversation they asked me what my dream project would be. And I said to show run and be in the new Galaxy Quest series. And they were like, it's so funny you say that because we wanted to ask you the same thing. Uh, he's like, my mind was totally blown. Nothing ever happens like that. And I'm so lucky to work with people at Paramount and Grand Via who are just as passionate about it as I am. And he couldn't, you know, confirm or deny any details that we've heard about the show. But he, uh, he doesn't want to give anything away. But he said, I love this movie. So I want to be respectful of what came before this, but also capture what was so exciting to me when I first saw this film and also as a fan of Star Trek and the world of sci-fi. What, what is weird is we have a new Star Trek, Star Trek TV show coming on, but we also have Seth MacFarlane's Orville, which is essentially Galaxy Quest, but probably with lots of flashbacks and Seth MacFarlane-like jokes. Um, do you think there is a market for more than one Star Trek parody show out there? I think that they'll be different enough that they'll work together in different ways. You know, we, uh, we haven't seen uh, the Orville yet, and I, the, the sense of humor from that show is very different simply because Seth MacFarlane is involved. And when you have a movie like Galaxy Quest, which has, you know, a, a cult following and a decent amount of fans, you know, it's gonna be, there's going to be a different vibe that comes from that as opposed to something with Seth MacFarlane. So I think that they can both coexist because Galaxy Quest was never, like, as much of a parody of star trek as seth MacFarlane seems to be doing it was it was respectful of the series and paid homage to it um 
but it was never like a flat out, you know, like poking fun at like the original premise of it in, in a way. I think that they're different enough that they can work yeah. harmoniously. I, I love Galaxy Quest and I, I, I fell in love with Galaxy Quest before I fell in love with Star Trek. Galaxy Quest for me was my entry point in understanding Star Trek and be, uh, developing a love for Star Trek. So uh, I'm all for it. And now for our feature presentation, joining us is director Kyle Newman, who you know as the filmmaker behind Fanboys, Barely Lethal, and uh, has a bunch of stuff in the works, including a Chewbacca movie, or a, I should say, Peter Mayhew movie uh, biopic called Chewy. Kyle, how's it going? Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. Uh, we have big news, guys. Big news in the, the world of Star Wars. For years, it has been rumored that they were developing a Obi-Wan Kenobi Star Wars spinoff. And now we have found out that that actually is in development and has a surprising director in talks. Brad, what do we know? Yeah, this story came out of nowhere today. Uh, it's um, confirmation that there's an Obi-Wan Kenobi spinoff in development, a standalone movie. And Stephen Daldry, the director behind uh, quiet dramas such as The Reader and The Hours, is apparently in very early talks to direct. But uh, apparently Entertainment Weekly followed up and cautioned that this is extremely early in development to the point that you know it's, it's not necessarily meant to be news just yet, but there's, there's just been some quiet development behind the scenes and making it happen. There's no script or anything like that yet. So, uh, yes, very early. Uh, I want to see. Well, first of all, I'm not very excited about this, guys, because uh, how did we get tricked into making a whole new set of Star Wars prequels? And I know Kyle's a uh, prequel uh, supporter, <laughs> defender, uh, but it seems like somehow with these spinoff movies, I thought we were going to get these new stories in a galaxy far, far away, but now we're just getting a set of more prequel origin stories kyle are you excited about this i am thoroughly excited about it and here's why i don't look at it as a prequel origin i feel like we've already gotten uh obi-wan's early life i feel like if this is going to be going down it's got to be set between the two trilogies and i also feel like there's a lot of rich territory to cover i don't see this as a small film. I see Obi-Wan as a wandering samurai, like all the great Kurosawa films, a man of honor and a culture that no longer has a need for him. He almost has to keep his identity under wraps. He's living with guilt. He's living with massive failure because he and Yoda failed at the end of Revenge of the Sith. I think dramatically it's set up in such a nice way, yet he also has to remain uh, rooted on Tatooine, remain in vigil as a sentinel watching over the, you know, one of the last hopes um, they go into hiding, he and Yoda, like two Sith. They're down to just two of them. There's some nice symmetry to it all. And, I mean, I wrote a story about this years ago. I wanted to do it as a, as a comic book almost before they took over, uh, Marvel took over. And it was, I mean, it's, it's a great little tale. And I think it's something that obviously I thought could be heavily mined. And I think they're going to go even further with it as a, as a film because – um, he's got an obligation now to something. He swore to Yoda and he swore to the future and he swore to this child and he knows the importance of it. Yet at the same time, he's going to watch and hear about terrible atrocities unfolding around the galaxy. Um, so there's just a lot of conflict built into it. And that's where they're going with it. And I hope that is. In the, in the comic books now, they're doing a lot of Obi-Wan on Tatooine, you know, a garden Luke from afar. But... Do you think this movie will take place primarily on that desert planet, or do you think this could be like a mission, you know, an off-planet mission? Like, it, it feels like there's not much that can be going on. It needs to be an off-planet mission, but that needs to come with consequence that he has to come back, and that maybe it's the only time he's ever left planet in the interim because of his steadfast vigil over Luke. Uh, so the mission itself has to be something of grave importance to pull him out, like... He knows of something might happen to Bale or some key people in the um, in the rebellion because you know he's operating on the fringes. That's where the rebellion recruits from. That's also where the empire is going to clamp down. Maybe he comes across information that he's actually got to get back to people. Um, so it's of extreme importance that he does this. And it's got to be like, well, if I don't do this, the rebellion is going to end. But if I but I'm also sworn to staying here and looking over Luke and making sure no one comes for him. So. 
it's it's got to have that huge dramatic conflict but i do think it has to take him off world and he has to get back to what his his new job is the one he's committed to brad should we be excited about this movie uh you know i mean i'm always interested in the new star wars movie but I, i'm right there with you where i i was hoping that we would eventually expand into stories that didn't involve these characters that we're already familiar with. I want to see new stories and I want to fall in love with new characters. And clearly there's the opportunity to introduce new characters that we can like here. But I just feel like Lucasfilm right now is using these, you know, legacy characters as a crutch. And I want, I want to see the galaxy expand more beyond the stories that we already know exist. I want, I want just something completely new, completely fresh. Like Uh, what they're doing with formers. (laughs) <laughs> no. well, this is like this is what well, this is not like the bumblebee movie equivalent this i think look star wars always borrowed from old japanese cinema samurai mythology obi-wan is literally that wandering samurai uh the character that's in all of those great kurosawa films i mean i think there's and star wars is best it's at its best when it's an amalgamation of many genres when it's pulling from other films not when it's eating itself alive from inside out so this is a great opportunity to go back to something simpler, mythic, um, foreign. I think Daldry, look, it's an, it's a, I was, I was a Kim at a left field, but that's inspired choice. It says a lot that they're going for something dramatic and, and cool. I also like Marvel's had great success taking people from smaller films and different genres and plugging them into their system. Um, it, it's also interesting because Lucasfilm has notoriously had a lot of problems with their, uh, filmmakers thus far you know there was obviously the reshoots on Rogue One there was the Josh Trank incident uh, there is Lord and Miller on Han Solo that got removed you know late into production I had heard from agents that you know Lucasfilm weren't looking they were looking for experienced filmmakers for the future of Star Wars um, Stephen D- Daldry seems like a weird choice to me ben, ben what do you think of this choice of a filmmaker yeah, I I mean, he's the guy who did Billy Elliot, The Hours, The Reader. Like Brad said, he's he's sort of known for more of these like quiet dramas. But I, you know, as much as I would have loved to see um, Lucasfilm pick, uh, you know, their first female director or maybe a director of color or something like that. Uh, I have to say within the, the uh, I guess, just white guy confines, this is definitely an interesting choice. And it, it makes me think that this is going to be a Star Wars movie that is totally different tonally than anything else that we've seen thus far. And, you know, initially I wasn't too excited about this, but honestly, after hearing Kyle sort of uh, (laughs) get passionate about it, I sort of am like maybe coming around to the idea a little bit. I think there is uh, maybe more potential there than I thought uh, at first. Exciting. I mean, I I mean, I, this, this is one of those, I have a lot of star Wars story ideas. This is one of those ones that I mapped out and I was like, this is, really prime territory with a character we love that didn't get enough central treatment in a movie. George has always said those movies can only tell the quick version of it, the highlights, mainly filtered through Anakin's eyes. Um, characters like Obi-Wan have always captivated us. He's he's a great character. And like I said, he and Yoda are, they're laced now and fused with failure. I mean, they fail. They fail all the way up until... They fail all through Return of the Jedi. They're telling him you have to kill your father. They fail in all their advice. Um, I read one terrible article before I came on, and someone was like, when Vader struck down Obi-Wan. It's like, newsflash, Vader didn't strike down Obi-Wan. You know what I mean? He literally, he didn't slice through him. Obi-Wan disappeared and became something greater because he adhered to a different type of training. All of that stuff, Qui-Gon becoming the master, becoming one with the Force, him having a totally different understanding of what it means to be attuned to the force. All that stuff can be explored in this movie. The mystical stuff that we want more of, the spiritual stuff that we didn't have time for even in uh, the prequels. There's that great scene that was written but cut out where Obi-Wan um, teaches Yoda and uh, when, when Qui-Gon teaches Obi-Wan and Yoda about love and the irony that Anakin wanted this greater knowledge and this greater connection and the fact that he went down this one path that he would never really achieve it and here Qui-Gon is primed to teach them both about becoming one with the force and you see Yoda learning that in these um deleted or the uh, the uh lost season yeah. Clone Wars season six uh, and Obi-Wan didn't go through that type of journey um 
So it's a good chance on screen for Obi-Wan to kind of go through his version of it and maybe atone for some of his mistakes and misguided. But Obi-Wan, he follows Qui-Gon and there's that friction and he knows it has to happen and he does everything he's supposed to do leading up to uh, the end of Revenge of the Sith and yet it still backfires and that's like the prophecy which he can't control. I mean the irony of the prophecy is that all the Jedi would be eradicated as well as the Sith, you know, and the Jedi would just fall first. Um, in order to truly balance. And that's a lot of weight, you know, to, for him to be living with in the desert by himself and a lot of time to think about it. You know, there's opportunity for him to have, commune with Obi-Wan, I mean, with Qui-Gon and Yoda. There's, um, I don't know, I, I'm thoroughly excited about it. I like this stuff. And ultimately, you said, you know, I think it's going to be different. It's not going to be different. Star Wars is its own genre. I know Lucasfilm keeps trying to explore these other ways of telling Star Wars stories. Star Wars is Star Wars. And they're going to, if they keep doing that, they're going to keep spending 50, 100 million, ultimately bringing it back to reality, which is this is what it is. You know, and you can tell these other types of stories, I think, further removed from the timeline and the Roman numeral timeline. If you want to go a thousand years into the past and make some movie that's tonally different. Yeah, I want to see Old Republic or, you know, th this, this story is literally a few steps away from A New Hope. Um, and Kyle, you. Your enthusiasm always gets me excited. Like, you know, I, I don't love the prequels, but hearing you talk about the prequels makes me want to watch the prequels with you and ex yes. experience well, in the way you do. Stories. You know what I mean? I love the stories of them. I think filmically there's some missteps. You know, I love George's commitment to innovation and new technology and shooting digitally and pushing boundaries. And those effects still look better than most of the movies that came out this summer. Um, but the bottom line is, like, you know, there's a Star Wars a way to tell a Star Wars story in a tone. And at the bottom of those movies is still this great mythology. You know, a fallen hero who becomes, you know, he's the chosen one and he fails and even his friends can't redeem him. And he turns to darkness. He eradicates all of his compatriots. And ironically, he's redeemed by familial love. His son ignores the Jedi and redeems him. I mean, and he he sets all that up in the prequels, you know, the rhythmics, uh, the rhythm, the rhythms of what Anakin goes through. Luke is then faced with, you know, Anakin's going to go back to Tatooine to save his mother, you know, but, um, you know, Luke's going to go to tattoo, uh, go to Cloud City to save his friends. It's all happening in these same yeah. places and they, they make mistakes or they succeed in different ways. And, um, but it's all been about Skywalker. So this is a cool chance to explore some of all these things and the ramifications of that through another character who's been there the whole time. So I hope it, it bears that weight. I hope it gets part, traumatic. Part of me wonders if this is actually not an Obi-Wan movie. Part of me wonders if that's what leaked out to the press. It seems like people want a Darth Vader movie, and they don't want you know the prequel in the Anakin Skywalker movie. They want a Darth Vader movie. And I'm wondering if this is a Darth Vader movie with Obi-Wan. But Obi-Wan and Darth Vader can't share scenes. Yeah. They, they, they because can't. he's very clear. He's like, when last I saw you, you know, you know. Actually, you're he, right. You were right. You were correct. There's very specific things in here, and then they balance that all through. Um, in Rebels, they haven't really encountered each other. I, I think you have to let those moments that when they finally uh, clash sabers again on uh, the Death Star, it's so charged because he hasn't seen him since he lost all his limbs 20 years prior. So I don't think you want to dilute it. Um, with any like halfway conflicts. And I'm sure there's ways to retcon that, but I, I don't want that. So maybe it's a Vader movie and Obi-Wan's in it, but they don't cross paths. But I also don't feel like Obi-Wan, he should only have one or two big things he does in those 20 years. Because for the most part, him coming out of hiding, him getting those Death Star plans, his call to action from Princess Leia, from the sibling of the child, you know, of, of the family he's protecting, it's, that's all huge, and you don't want to dilute that. And in order to not dilute it, don't go there. It's really simple. And there's so many other ways to tell a cool story without having to dilute it and then wash it over. And just as like I said, by pure genre trappings alone, this is like a, an amazing chance to do a samurai film, a fa failed samurai with another shot at redeeming himself, but still trying to honor what he stood for, which is like protecting – Luke and this legacy of the Jedi and, and Yoda's vision for how they have to save, you know, how this is their last hope to do it. 
Um, but well, well, like, when the Star Wars well, anthology movies were first announced, there was rumors that Zack Snyder was pitching this Seven Samurai movie that took place with like either Obi Wan or Yoda. I'm um, still hearing that. What was that? I'm still hearing about not the Snyder. Not maybe, Snyder. But I'm still hearing about something like that. I'm wondering if this could be that movie because if you think about it, like it would be interesting to put Obi Wan at the center of that somehow. It'd be um, interesting. If there were other there. Look, when they say there's no other Jedi, they're saying it in a sense that I don't. I never took it, at least as I've grown to take it, as non literal. There's no other Jedi on the level that you are that can do this. You are the person destined to take him down. So they're meaning there's no other person that could achieve success in this situation. You and your familial connection might be the only person with the power and, and the ability to unlock your father. They don't mean there are zero force sensitives left in the galaxy. I think people take it so literal. I think everything Obi-Wan says is he's presenting it in a dramatic way with a little bit of you know, emphasis to convince Luke to do things. So there could be other Jedi that Obi-Wan knows about that survived because he went to the temple, he changed the signal, he warned Jedi off from coming home to the temple and getting slaughtered. So maybe there's other ones out there. Maybe he teams up with six other uh, Jedi slash samurai to be the seven samurai for one mission in between. And maybe Obi-Wan's not there and Vader kills the other six and he doesn't have a chance to fight him, but then Obi-Wan's still free to go fight him on the Death Star and have their final face off. There's so many ways to do this. I mean, if you want to do a seventh samurai that you could have other Jedi be alive and it wouldn't rub with the, um, with the cannon. Well, and as we've seen too, there, it's not as if there aren't other force sensitive people who aren't Jedi as well. I mean, I think one of the coolest things to do would be since this is going to be set between revenge of the Sith and a new hope is to maybe somehow involve. And by the way, pure... do we do we know that for a fact? We don't know that. Well, no, no, no. We don't, we don't know that for a fact. But I'm saying if it is, then you could do something a lot. You could where you could uh, part of the Seven Samurai could even incorporate uh, Chirrut Imwe and Baze Malbus, which would be awesome if they at some point they encountered Obi Wan Kenobi and and worked with him on some kind of mission. And, and you can even w- without having Obi Wan and Darth Vader meet, you can still have this dichotomy between them where Obi-Wan's always maybe like a step ahead of Vader or something like that. Because at some point, Obi-Wan has to become aware of what Anakin has become by some way because he even, he's the one who says he's more machine than man now. So either he's heard from somebody what Anakin has become or that like at some point there they were like very close to meeting again and like and he you know he, he figured it out, it out somehow. Yeah, so yeah. And, because he, uh, what he's doing is he's passing, he's keeping the rebellion alive, or he's doing something very important to helping people that are aligned with what he would love to have happen. But at the same time, he knows he can't, in the end, in that third act, he can't go head to head with Vader, knowing how he's grown in power or what's on the line. So he's got to, he moves the ball a little bit for the rebellion, but he can't go into that conflict, or he stays yeah. in the shadows out of it. But he sees what Vader is doing. There's a lot of there's a lot of rich it, ways. It, it's interesting though because the end of this movie, you can't have him defeat the big bad guy. Do you know what I mean? It has to be a small win of some kind. He achieved something though in the spirit of perpetuating or saving or helping resolve yeah. the rebellion and its nurturing its growth. But I heard a, a couple of years ago that there was an Obi Wan time being explored where it was him and young Anakin, and I was like, wait, that's pre. Um, it'd be pre Hugh McGregor because he's older now. Did you guys ever hear this? No, I hadn't. Yeah, and it was, uh, and it was before the comic came out with the Obi Wan and Anakin huh. comic. And I think some of what Marvel's doing is cool, but a lot of it's yeah. just I feel like it's far too accelerated. I think they're just like burning through every legacy character with one shots and stuff. And like, yeah, what's well, it's the same thing with that I don't like about Star Wars. I, I know you're saying things go back to the same planets, the same people, but I want this galaxy to be bigger. I don't want. You know, I'd love to see Bays and Jurit come back, but I don't want to because I want to see new characters. Yeah, I don't need uh, to see Bays and them come back. Yeah. I, I mean, it's cool. I mean, I wouldn't say I wouldn't hate it, but at the same time, I think there's other ways to go without having to make the universe that small. Yeah. And I don't feel uh, like Obi Wan makes it small, though. I feel like he's so fused with these original six films that um, it's okay. Peter, what do you think about the? potential of Darth Maul coming back. I know we were just talking about like, oh, it's not great to bring back other characters, but that could be a way to uh, potentially have 
Obi-Wan get um, a victory that means maybe a little bit more than a character that we've never heard from again. You know, I I initially thought I initially thought that that was what was going to be the Obi-Wan movie. But it seems like Dave Filoni has kind of explored that to its end point without spoiling yeah. anything in Star Wars Rebels. Uh, which, by the way, Filoni should be the one making this movie. Uh, I want to see Filoni direct a live action Star Wars film. Uh, but there's nothing more frustrating than watching them bring in outsiders. Um, look, look, I'm not dissing on the Daldry choice. I think that's cool. Yeah, uh, I like different people, I like dramatic people in charge. I think just because you know visual effects or something doesn't mean you know how to make a Star Wars movie. Like James Gunn, right? Look at James Gunn. I mean, I love he's he's like a hero. He goes in, from a small movie and he just plugged into the Marvel system and he's able to bring his voice out in that film and still make a movie that's like a James Gunn film, but in the Marvel way. Like, there's room for you to do that in these big studio films, and so I hope these people's voices come through. But Filoni is the number one custodian. He's like a living library. He knows the way George thinks. He knows the brand inside and out. He knows what works. He's tried everything. He's already beta tested a lot of this stuff in between Clone Wars and Rebels. And, and there's just no, a, he's a great storyteller. He's a great storyteller who gets it. There's no reason why he shouldn't be on one of these films. Like, I mean, that's, it's a no brainer to me. Like he's the yeah. one person I would love to see in charge. And not only that, he's earned it. He's he's paid his dues up there. He's done every type of Star Wars storytelling, and he's done it under the tutelage of George. Why is he not directing a live action film? I I agree. Uh, Brad, Ben, do do you have any more thoughts on the subject? Um, I would say so. You know, we're talking a lot about like wanting uh, Lucasfilm to branch out and um, you know give us completely new stories. I'm wondering if. Uh, and we'll know this maybe after uh, The Last Jedi, which is something we're about to talk about. But uh, if that movie um, reveals that Obi-Wan is actually related to Rey, are we going to see that in this Obi-Wan spinoff? Um, that could be another wrinkle thrown into this whole thing. I didn't even think about that. If she did turn out to be related to Obi-Wan, yeah, that... that why they're doing this because they're they're building the synergy into it and that's one of the first things i thought about but then i don't i never liked the kenobi idea did you i mean it's not like it's kenobi's daughter it's kenobi had offspring and then they had offspring and now we need to spend 10 minutes of screen time explaining that you, you, you know, know look, 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 he actually look. had a girl and then that girl had a kid and then you're just like why is this important why his blood is not that special it's he's just a jedi He's like a good Jedi, but he wasn't like the most famous Jedi. He's not like the chosen one like Anakin. So his lineage means almost nothing. Yes, he's force sensitive, but like I never understood that. It, it's too much, too much explaining. I, I, I agree with you. Let's jump into the mailbag because we're already on to the last Jedi. Uh, Mark Goodsiff from the UK asks, uh, I'm wondering if you guys have specific ideas about the plot of the last Jedi. Who is Snoke? Why is Luke on Octu? Why? Are, uh, who are Ray's parents? Over at Talk Star Wars, he runs a podcast called Talk Star Wars. We speculate about these things. I'm always kind of he- keen to hear the thoughts of other Star Wars fans. Once again, great podcast. Um, yeah, let's start with Ray because we, we, we just talked about her. I mean, obviously they built it up. I mean, J.J. Abrams built it up. She has to be the daughter of someone, right? Like I don't. Uh, I, I don't think so. I mean, one of the one of the theories that I recently read or a suggestion that I, I read sounds way more interesting to me um, and it would also help fix one of the glaring problems I think li- that lies in the prequels is that maybe she doesn't that she doesn't have to be related to anybody and if we if anything we find out her bloodline isn't important at all and we learn that midi chlorians aren't exa- or aren't what matters when it comes to being force sensitive or having any ability whatsoever to become a Jedi so maybe she's just nobody and she, you know, that and she has the strength inside of her for for no reason except that she, you know, be, believes yeah. in it or, or so, you know, something like that. And so we, we don't have to have that connection to the prequels anymore. That doesn't sound like Joseph Conrad mythology. That sounds like modern cop out to me. No, I like, agree. When, when I when I talk to when I talk, or she's like the product of the Force. Like to me, it's a Skywalker story. It's always been that the Roman number films are a Skywalker story, and. For her, I feel like there's so, the vestiges of all these cut things and rethinks and all. If you really watch The Force Awakens, she used to be related to somebody. 
And it's even in the novelization. It says, you know, Princess Leia hugs her the way only a mother could. And Snoke's like, perhaps Kylo Ren was right about the identity of the girl. General Hux, go get Kylo Ren from the forest. That's like what he's saying in the book, which was written out of the outline, Alan Dean Foster, that he was given. It's all set up that she's related to someone. How could Kylo be, perhaps Kylo was right about the identity of the girl, that he was, that she was nobody? No, that she was somebody. It was all in the DNA of the film, and it's still there. They cut it all out. But I don't think that they that they knew yet what it was going to be when that outline was written, because uh, back in the early days of Force Awakens, I, I specifically knew people who were part of the production, and the original idea was that she was going to be tied to Obi-Wan in some way, but then later on, that, that did not become a specific part of the Force Awakens outline and script, and it was something that was left intentionally to be more vague. Yeah. But the thing, the thing is also what J.J. has set up is not necessarily what's going to happen, but when I talked to J.J. during the uh, junket for Force Awakens, I remember I had this conversation, I'll, I'll link it in the show notes, but it was about him talking about the idea of a chosen one and the idea that you know that you don't need to have like that anybody could be a Jedi, and that it, it doesn't need to be something that is based on your blood count or you know metachlorian. It's not based on your blood count, though. That's the thing. I think it's 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 strange to think that you'd have uh, these people who are kind of the Jedi who would have zero biological understanding of why they're different from the average person. Um, after 10,000 years of existence, I don't think having a scientific way to quantify it reduces the mysticism or spirituality. Well, I, I, of, I, I, don't, but, I agree with you, but I would say that maybe the metachlorian count in people can grow or change based on. I don't think they ever need to mention the metachlorians again. They don't. But what I'm saying is like, I, I, I think, you, them, but they don't need to dwell on them. And she should either be and I think she's going to be nothing. To be honest, my money's on nothing. And that's what I'm feeling like. People up there like this idea, like you could be anybody. And that's like, that's from what people gathered from A New Hope. And that's not necessarily what George intended. And people want to go back to that. But I feel like she should either be a product of the force, like she is a new incarnate of the chosen one. Um, she is related to Anakin in that spiritual sense. Or I think she should be a daughter of, of somebody of Skywalker lineage. But I feel like neither of those are, are what's going to happen. I agree. Uh, okay, let's move on to who is Snoke. Brad, what is your best, worst Snoke theory? Uh, I would like to think that Snoke is um, a really old version of John McClane who is just still desperate to go on vacation. <laughs> um, my, my, my theory that I, I had for the longest time was, and I think I've said this on this podcast, is that Snoke is the grandfather of Rey. Uh, because I like the idea of Kylo coming from the good guys and Ray coming from the bad guys and the symmetry of that. I think George Lucas would have liked the symmetry of that. Um, but they've said that Snoke is not a human. Uh, ben, do you have any theories? Uh, no, but I love that one. That's the first time I've heard that theory. And I think, you know, especially with all of the, the rhythmic connections and stuff like you guys have been talking about with the prequels, I think that makes a ton of sense. I think they could maybe get around that by you know, he's not a human right now. Uh, you know, he has evolved into something else or, you know, like like a, a Vader, more machine than man kind of situation again um, where they could get around that. But that sounds like a really... Because, like, yeah, who is he otherwise? I don't know. Uh, Kyle, do you have any any thoughts on that? We know he's, he's very tall. It looks like in his body, when you look at it, he looks like he has holes in his neck. Maybe it looked like cloning went wrong. But it's interesting, you know, they say he's not human. So, but that, didn't at one point they say he would be tied to something or characters we knew from the original trilogy? I remember, like, Lore Santeca was hyped up to be somebody important from the prequel era, and it turned out he was a throwaway character. Uh, there was oh. a lot of people that were hyped up. I mean, I I, I see shelves of Constable Zuvio action figures, <laughs> and I, I, I still have never Watch seen him the in the Church movie. Of the Jedi just over the sand dune from Rey. <laughs> you know, who? Like, were they not there, like, watching over her in a sense? You know, someone dropped her off, but, like, there, I, I don't know if there were supposed to be these ties to it, but it's like, here you have this girl who's this important character, and you have this, in the middle of nowhere planet just over the sand dune is, like, this whole settlement of jedi church worshipers it says there's this weird proximity to it I, I think snoke i think he's gone through a lot of changes 
I don't know why you get the number one mocap guy in the universe to come sit in a chair. Um, <clears throat> doesn't make any sense to look like a human. Uh, I mean, I've seen concept art where he was uh, based on another type of creature. So that made more sense to me. Um, so I think his, his backstory... Well, I, I, I know that J.J. Abrams was shown in early cut of Dawn of the Planet of the Apes by uh, Matt Reeves before they actually did the CG. And he was watching just basically Andy Serkis in his mocap suit as Caesar. And after he saw that screening was when he called Circus to cast him in the movie. So I, I think you're right. He's great. But I, I think he was supposed to be something else. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, you, I've seen, you, you don't, you don't have any crazy theories. Um, I know he wasn't supposed to be human, clearly not human. And then it looked like he went human. And I really felt like they were tying him to some other things from the past. But I feel like now that he's eight feet tall and he looks like a mutated clone. I mean, I'm I'm really lost on it. I don't know. I think, I think he's a great character though, and I think they've done a good job at steeping him in uh, some mystery. I want that action figure. It better not come in that giant BBA playset only, because that would be a, 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 a <laughs> catastrophe. Um, he should be like a mail away. Send in five proofs of purchases. Get your goddamn Snoke action figure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Why is he not an action? We should be pre-ordering that now, like the Mace Windu. That remember that one? Yeah. Why? Why, <laughs> why, why can't you order an BB-8 action figure alone? I, I don't understand why it has to come in a set of something or with Ray. Like, what if I just why want BB-8 the Luke action figure from from the Force Awakens? There still isn't a, a, a three and three quarter yeah. inch. Luke Skywalker. It's kind of madness. There was no Snoke. He's the primary villain. They, they almost like they they misstepped it, like um, you know, having no Tarkin in the original line. Yeah. Well, I think this is all JJ's mystery box. He didn't want to release the concept art uh, to the toy people, which rightfully so. A lot of the stuff leaks very early from that department. Um, we should go on. Uh, one of his other questions was Luke on Octu. Um, I mean, I think we kind of know about that, right? Like he yeah. he went to find the Jedi Temple. That's like the whole. It's like explicitly stated in the Force Awakens, and then in some of the Entertainment Weekly coverage that's come out recently, he's talked about, um, right? Like, didn't we cover that? Yeah, he's pretty talked, recently. He's talked about being kind of devastated and feeling responsibility for not only not recognizing Ben Solo, the darkness in Ben Solo, but being responsible for what happened. He said he thought Ben was the chosen one. Did you see that in one of the EW articles? Yeah, I did a whole yeah. article on that. What do you think of yeah, that, Kyle? Because I, I, that's interesting because that means that that means that Luke never thought that he was the chosen one, which I feel like after Jedi, after the, uh, what? Luke thought Anakin was the chosen one. Or, or yeah, I would think that Luke would have thought I, I would have thought that Luke either thought Anakin was the chosen one or he was the chosen one. Because after Jedi, you know, the Empire has been defeated. You know, we we brought balance to the Force. But apparently... That appar makes no sense to me. Like, I, I read that and I read it five times and I was still perplexed. And I was like, this is something... It really throws me because it's pretty clear to me at the end of Return of the Jedi that Luke and Anakin were made of a different mold. Skywalkers were very different. And the Emperor was blindsided by the fact that both Vader and Luke chose a familial love that's what overthrew him and the jedi luke was tasked with killing him saying this is the only way thing you can do is defeat the sith in this very you know traditional linear way and luke throws down his saber and puts it all into love which is something that the jedi don't adhere to or believe in and they both do something different than what they're supposed to and that's what basically defeats the jedi and the sith ultimately fulfilling the prophecy balancing the force luke would know that the force was then balanced he watched all of the Jedi get killed. He's heard about it. He's watched all of the Sith now gone, and it's just him there. And if he chooses to put down his saber and do nothing and be a zero influence on the Force, the Force is balanced. Um, why Ben Solo is the chosen one when he's done nothing but be born? I, I don't. I don't understand why he would have that perception. And you know, from the Bloodline novel, we know Luke seven years before. The events of the Force Awakens. It's only seven years before the events of the Force Awakens is when Ben Solo finds out that his grandfather is Darth Vader publicly. Um, so that's when everything goes down shortly after that. So he hasn't been Kylo Ren for that long. And Luke's not just going to Octo on, on a sojourn. God bless you. He's going, he's, <laughs> he's going to Octo purely because he made a mistake. He had... he. He didn't perceive something correctly or he needs greater answers. He needs to go deeper. So 
But I don't know why he would perceive Ben to be the chosen one and why he would then pick up, start a temple and train 50 new kids and give them brown robes when the Jedi failed ultimately at their mission. Well, we, we have heard him in the trailers basically kind of it doesn't seem like he believes that the Jedi way is the right way anymore, which is uh, good. That's I like that introduction that's rattling the mythology because this is mythology. So if it doesn't do that mythological fantasy thing, it really doesn't belong in Star Wars. And that is the genre of Star Wars. And so that was great. I was like, oh, we're on track here. He says the light. She's the light. She sees the darkness and she sees balance. And then he said the Jedi must end. Not that that's going to definitely happen, but I, or, I mean, I hope it does. But I think that's. Um, Luke's had to have learned something in these past 30 years and his father balanced the force. His father was the chosen one. His father fulfilled the prophecy. Ironically, he eradicated all the Jedi in the process too, but that was part of the balancing act. That's the action that he did. Luke was this familial conduit that helped unlock that and reawaken him and realign him to complete almost his, his fated task. Um, and that's what Yoda and Obi-Wan put their faith in that, that somehow, they don't know how, but somehow this kid would be that important. One of these kids would work. And so I, I just don't get it how Luke would not think that his father was the chosen one. Like that to me is just like, did we watch the same film? Like, <laughs> you know, I, I, I agree. Uh, we need to cut it off here. We have gone long. Kyle, what are you working on now? What, what, what can we see next from you? Um, a couple things. I got a, a great uh, book, a side project coming out next year through Penguin Random House, 10 Speed Press on uh, the history of Dungeons and Dragons. I'm working with some cool people on it. I'm a big yeah. Dungeons and Dragons fan. That's a coffee table book. Um, working with Wizards of the Coast. And um, I've got uh, a couple of films that I'm casting right now. Um, it is a Chewbacca film still happening or is that kind of iffy now you know, that I love Disney project we haven't done anything with it since the acquisition and um it's a wonderful script it really doesn't tread on anything it's the peter mayhew story really how he kind of got pulled into it and that was the uh, script that was on the blacklist right it's on the blacklist yeah. yeah it's it's a beautiful little script it's uh, i hope one day to make it but it's not anything i'm actively doing considering the transition that happened and um uh you know how how they're you know close to keeping their cars <laughs> to their chest how they're exploring their characters but uh, maybe one day. And, um, you know, a couple of these things I'm doing now, there's some smaller dramas that I'm I'm, uh, I'm uh, putting out to see what happens first. And then I'm writing some stuff, so bigger things coming uh, after that that I'm ready to go on. So I've been in this heavy uh, writing phase. So I'm very excited about unleashing it all. Well, that is cool. And you've been doing those radio plays at Star Wars Celebration, the Star Wars radio I, plays. Google, yeah, Star Wars Smugglers. Um the last one came with Smuggler's Revenge. It stars Warwick Davis, and we've got you know, a lot of the cast from from uh, Star Wars Rebels in it. It's just it was so much fun putting it together. David Collins plays uh, Han Solo, and we record them live on stage with sound effects, with music, blasters, droids, everything. Um, Can we and, find that on YouTube or anywhere? Yeah, you go on YouTube and just type in Star Wars Smuggler's Revenge. You watch the whole panel. Uh, I'll, I'll link it in the show notes so people can watch it. Yeah, and also it's on StarWars.com. You can watch the first first chapter, which was Smuggler's Gambit. That's an audio format. We kind of post-produced it afterwards to kind of align it more with you know Star Wars NPR and really tightened it up. But all these are recorded in one take, and it's just a testament to how great these voice actors are. They come in, they nail it, and we're firing off live effects and playing music and mixing it live together in front of thousands of people. Um, and then the second part was Smuggler's Bounty, which was a lot of fun, and then we concluded it with Smuggler's Revenge. But I'm sure I'm going to do another one for the next uh, domestic celebration. I just love that format. Yeah, it's fun to do it live. I mean, no one's doing anything like it. It's not like a podcast. It is like a live stage show, performed in one single take, one time only. For sure. And people can find you on Twitter at, at Kyle underscore Newman and Kyle underscore Newman at Instagram, and I'm on Facebook. You always come talk uh, Star Wars with me there. I'm, I'm always down. Well, thank you for coming on, Kyle. You can find me oh. at Slash Film. You can find Ben at Ben P- at Ben Peer- Pears on Twitter. You can find Brad at Ethan underscore Anderton on Twitter. Uh, you can find more of all, everything we mentioned on SlashFilm.com. Links are in the show notes. Subscribe to Slash Film Daily on iTunes, Google Play, Overcast, and all the popular podcast apps. Please, if you like the show, go to iTunes. Give us a review. Rate us. Uh, that helps us a lot. And spread the word. We will see you tomorrow.